Yeah, as Brandon said, I am the worship pastor here. I have the honor and the privilege of leading the worship ministry. Um, I don't play favorites, but I have one favorite, who is my husband, who plays drums. So he's my fave. Um, Woo, yes, give it up. Uh, We have called Mountain View home for the past six years. We love this church, we love this community, we love this people. Um, When I say it's an honor and privilege, it's like I, it's like every Sunday I'm like, wow, I get to do this again? This is awesome. (laughs) Um, So super honored to be here. Um, We have four kiddos that we're raising, um, ages 16, 14, 10, and 8, boys and girls. So Yes, we have our hands full. Yes, we are in those family years, driving around, all the things. But it is a good, full life. So, Brandon mentioned that we are in the middle of this series. And just as a quick recap, I'm going to just kind of blow through the recap here of what we've kind of heard so far these past few weeks. We've heard about um, how this is the first public discourse of Jesus. It's his first public sermon. Um, he, before he, he sat down to deliver the sermon, he was traveling throughout the region. He was teaching in synagogues. He was healing diseases, um, things like demon possession, things like paralysis, um, seizures. And his fame was spreading. People were were becoming more aware of of Jesus. And so what that created was a lot of uh, expectation, a lot of anticipation. They had a lot of different people who had agendas and motives for wanting to know, uh, wanting to be interested in who this Jesus was. Um, People had political motivations. They had sort of religious law-keeping motivations. They had, there was revolutionaries who wanted him to overthrow the government. Um, And then there was kind of everyone else. It was like the poor people, many of whom had just been healed, Um, immigrants, kind of the, the down and outs, the outcasts, people who really had not a lot of voice or access in society. We heard about the Beatitudes, which is, this is his proclamation of, um, he said that he, he's come to bring the good news of the kingdom of God. And so he, his first words, he is proclaiming uh, the nature of the kingdom of God and to whom he's bringing the kingdom. And this is really in, impactful because he begins his sermon, his first public sermon, by addressing the poor. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are, things like blessed are you who mourn. Blessed are the meek, people who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So this was quite an um, unexpected way for him to start his ministry. Um, and so the message there is that the good news is for everybody, and he's coming first to the poor. It's for everyone, but he's coming first to the disenfranchised. We heard about how as followers of Jesus, we're meant to be salt and light. We're meant to be active participants in bringing the kingdom on earth. Um, Salt had a preserving and healing component, right? We're meant to preserve what's good in the world and to heal what's wounded. And as light bearers, we are meant to have our light shine. Um, Hi, Kim. (laughs) You guys, I'm sorry, I have to stop because every time I'm on the stage and someone comes in and then I'm just like, oh, my people, oh, my people. And already it's been probably all of you. I'm just like, oh, yeah, you and you and you and you. So thank you for being here. And I want a deep breath and <laughs> center myself. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, uh, light bearers. We're meant to shine the light of Jesus. We're meant to reflect the image of God in the world. And so that our good deeds, our work and worship in the world will will reflect our Father in heaven. That's part of our role. Um, And then we get into this section where Jesus starts quoting specific parts of the law, which he said he is not... Uh, he's not getting rid of. He's not abolishing the law and the prophets, but he's come to fulfill the law. Um, And so he starts quoting specific parts. Last week we heard about how you've heard that it was said, do not commit murder. And then, but then he goes into how being angry with your brother um, is just as damaging. He like, it's just the same as killing your brother. And so these teachings start to become 
curious, right? It starts to become, okay, this isn't quite what the people were expecting. Um, so, but Jesus is taking us on this journey um, as listeners then in the crowd and as readers and hearers now of the, of the scriptures, we're on this journey with Jesus. So this brings us up to our text for today. And it is uh, chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. And in our English Bibles, the heading is lust. So, yay, lust. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read it from the ESV, and then I'm going to pray, and then we'll dig right in. So here's the text. Chapter, or verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Let's take a minute to pray. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence. Thank you for, be, for making us more aware of you as we sang songs to you just minutes ago. Thank you for this gathered body. Thank you for your church. Thank you for this neighborhood. God, we want a fresh revelation from you. These words may be familiar to us, but we want a fresh revelation of who you are, your intent behind the words. We want to have eyes to see you and ears to hear your wisdom, Jesus. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And I say to you, anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So a couple things. This is a direct quote of the seventh commandment, and then it also kind of includes the tenth commandment. The seventh is straightforward. It says you shall not commit adultery, period, end of. The tenth commandment is do not covet your neighbor's wife, do not covet your neighbor's ox, or pretty much just a litany of things you're not supposed to covet that belong to your neighbor. So in the tenth it's with that kind of lust, uh, objectification language, the lusting after the woman. It's sort of inferred there, the coveting. Um, so yeah, so that's there. The simple definition of adultery just is, the simple definition is sex between two people where one of them is married, uh, yeah, where one of them is married. So this implies a marriage covenant. Adultery implies the marriage covenant. This is the context of marriage. Um, another thing that would have been swirling in, when they heard the word adultery, um, for anyone familiar with the law and the prophets, this, this, this concept of adultery was used pretty prominently and provocatively as a metaphor for the unfaithfulness of God's people against God. So there were, you know, Hosea and Jeremiah, and there were prophets sent to, the, to God's people um, with strong metaphor um, about how uh, their adulterous hearts, they were referred to as harlots um, for essentially stepping out of the marriage covenant and uh, being unfaithful to God. So that's also a there in the language that would have been a part of how people heard this. Um, so another thing to notice here is that, you know, when we, ha we see the, the male pronouns, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So this is um, specifically directed at men, at married men. And um, I have to be honest, I didn't want this to be that specific. I, I didn't really, I kind of bristled at the concept of this being so narrow. Um, I mean, we're 2024, 20, right? Um, women, we, women, if you didn't know, are sexual beings and we have desires. And it's, you know, so we're living in this era where this is now things we know. But um, 
so it felt a little bit like, well, what's going to happen in this text? I'm not sure I want to go on this journey. Um, but it's, there's some specificity here, and as we go through, um, it'll, it'll kind of reveal itself. Um, on a practical level, uh, it, it was a patriarchal society. So just kind of on a, a practical level of like giving the law, uh, much of the law was directed at men because it, the men were the primary actors in society. So, so there were more laws for the men. Um, and yes, there's, there are instances where there's, there are examples in the Old Testament in Numbers, for example, where there's provision in the law for how to deal with an unfaithful wife. So it's acknowledged. The, the punishment itself for adultery in Leviticus 20.10 um, shows that it's a capital crime with a capital punishment, meaning both parties would be put to death, and that would be a fulfillment of the law. It says, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. So, period. That's it. <laughs> that pretty, pretty much sums it up. Um, but, but in his specificity, I do believe Jesus is addressing a deeper social reality um, wherein women did not have agency in their own lives, by and large. They were not uh, regarded most often or treated equally uh, to men in society. They were not the ones making the decisions for themselves. A lot of times they were even referred to and considered property. So, more often than not, women were acted against rather than advocated for. And this is the social context that Jesus is arriving into. I mean, remember Ruth. We were, we were in the book of Ruth a couple months ago as a church body. Um, it was so uh, desperate of a faith for her to make this plan with her mother-in-law to arrive on the threshing floor and somehow make herself known to Boaz, um, who she didn't know if he was going to be a righteous man or not, right? It, it, it turned out to be a good story because he, did, he was righteous. But the norm would have been to expect uh, bad things to happen to her on the threshing floor. And she was making herself very vulnerable. Um, and in fact, Boaz needed to tell the workers on his land, hey, leave her alone, don't touch her, These, she's with me, like just let her work and let her, let her follow the women. So there was sort of this implication that the assumption was that something, she would have been taken advantage of. So think to say more often than not, women were acted against rather than advocated for, um, I think that, that holds. So... These Pharisees, the, remember the law keepers, the Pharisees and the scribes, they actually took the law seriously. I mean, that was kind of their downfall, right? They, they were legalists through and through. They wanted to keep the law at all costs. And so, but that, what that meant was they would sort of pervert, they would kind of find ways to circumvent the law so they wouldn't technically be violating it. And yet they carried on taking advantage of women who were vulnerable in society. This would include activities with um, prostitutes, temple prostitutes, uh, just various things in society. I'm not sure how mixed of a crowd we have here today, so I'm just going to leave it at that. But um, they, would, they would figure out ways to keep the law, technically, um, and yet they were still complicit in sin. And that's what Jesus is revealing. So, um, I think a good story that, that illustrates this in, in the Gospel of John um, well, illustrates this, that they also, women also were um, not only the most vulnerable or more vulnerable than men, but they also kind of bore the brunt and the responsibility and consequences of sexual sin. And so when we look at John chapter... 8 verses 3 to 11. I won't read it all here, but this is the story of when the scribes and the Pharisees have caught a woman in adultery and they drag her out and they're like, they 
Jesus, look at this woman. She's been caught in adultery. And the law of Moses says that she should be stoned to death. What do you say? And verse 6 says, they said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. So not only is she the only one brought in front of Jesus, where's the guy, where's the man, nowhere to be seen, right? But she's also a pawn in this, um, in the Pharisees and the scribes. They, they're willing to follow through on stoning this woman, carrying out the letter of the law, in the name of proving a point with Jesus, in the name of catching Jesus out. So just very little regard. It made me think about how how we can do that today. I mean, obviously we live in under different laws. It's not a capital punishment. Um, it isn't... Uh, according to God, isn't okay that we, that I am in adultery, that I cheat on my husband, right? That's not acceptable. But it's not, I'm not going to be dragged out and stoned to death for it. So what does it look like, what can it look like or sound like today? Um, What are some of the ways that we sort of feel like we're doing good, feel like we're living a good life? a good life, but maybe we're fostering an inward, uh, something different on the inside of our hearts. I think sometimes it can sound like, oh, well, boys will be boys. Or it can sound like, well, she was asking for it dressed like that. Or it can sound like, well, she didn't say no. Or it can sound like, well, I'm not you know, sleeping around with people. So, yeah, I use pornography, but at least I'm not sleeping around with people. I mean, these are some kind of different things we maybe say, and they're maybe more socially acceptable to us, um, but is that really what Jesus wants for our hearts, for our attitudes? So, we've looked at the social context of Jesus' day. We've defined adultery in the law, and we're going to keep going in the text. Um, Tim Mackey is a uh, biblical scholar of the Bible Project. He's the, he does a lot of his own translations. He's a mega Bible nerd. He calls himself that. Um, and so his translation actually was pretty helpful of verse 28. It says, because we're going to look at defining lust now says, and I say to you, anyone who goes on looking at a woman in order to cultivate lust for her, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Goes on looking at a woman in order to cultivate lust for her. So it's this ongoing, it's that leering, it's staring, it's um, lingering eyes in order to. It's with the purpose, with the express purpose of cultivating lust. In Greek, uh, it's this word epithemeo, and it's a verb uh, to turn upon a thing. Let's, doesn't sound good. To have desire for, to long for, to lust after, to covet those who seek things forbidden. So it's almost as if you get the sense that the, the lusting and the craving and the savoring of the fantasy, that's that's the goal itself when, in this lustful intent. That's, that's what's behind these words. Um, I want to make the distinction that this is different from uh, looking at a woman and appreciating physical beauty. I mean, men and women were meant to be attracted to each other. I mean, there's, there's beauty in the world. There's beauty in the human form. So it's not, it's not that. And so N.T. Wright a New Testament scholar, he says it this way. He says, don't suppose that Jesus means you must never feel the impulse of lust when you look at someone attractive. That would be impossible and, in, and is not in any case what the words mean. What he commands us to avoid is the gaze and the lustful imagination that follow the initial impulse. So the lustful imagination 
So here again, as with murder and anger, we see that Jesus is saying the internal, the internal reality uh, is just as important as the external reality. He's saying that the internal, seemingly private act of looking with lustful intent is the same as the outward, quantifiable act of adultery. I mean, that's, that's pretty shocking, <laughs> right? I mean, it was shocking when he said it about anger and murder. Um, you know, but I think by now we're kind of getting a sense of, okay, Jesus, we're on this journey. What, what do you have for us? Um, and so I do believe that in, in the heart of what Jesus is saying is that women matter to me, and I care about how men look at women. I think the underlying theological concept under this is the concept of um, the imago Dei, the image of God, is that all people, male and female, were created in the image of God. I mean, think about the Trinity, God is relationship. He's three persons in one. He's Father, Son, and Spirit. And this is a mystery, but this is, this is who the Lord is. He exists in loving relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so when it says, let us make mankind, male and female, in our own image, the inference is that we are most in the image of God when we are in loving relationship. It's, it's a point of identity. It's who we are. We can't be loving our neighbor if we are objectifying them for our pleasure. So Jesus goes on, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. So this was interesting for me because he goes from the external, right, adultery, to he makes the point about it being within our hearts, and then he moves back out to the external. Hands and eyes being gouged out and cut off. Um, it's also weird because he was literally just healing people moments ago. He was healing bodies, restoring mental capacity, restoring emotional capacity, physical bodies. So clearly he, he cares about the human body. He's not uh, reasonably suggesting that this is a solution to the problem. Um, so what's going on? I think much of this is hyperbole. This is exaggerate, exaggeration to make a point. Um, he, I think he's, he, what's going on here is he's saying, you know, if you've made it a habit to go on looking at a woman in order to cultivate lust for her, if this is your posture, um, you should take drastic measures to stop what you're doing. Like, get rid of it, right? There, there's, that's there. You should stifle the growth of that lustful intent. But I think kind of to pull the thread a little bit more, um, you know, look, looking with lustful intent can seem harmless, like a, like a victimless crime, right? Like it's just me looking, uh, a person looking. That's an inward reality. So how does that, how does that matter, right? Um, but we are, there is mutuality between humans, whether we acknowledge it or not. But that's the reality, right? Back to the image of God. That's how we're made. And so Dr. King, I love this quote from Dr. King. He says it this way. He says, we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. Tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So don't be fooled by your inward looking, he's saying. It has implications and ramifications. And I think coupled with the hyperbole, you know, it's this rhetorical device to kind of be a little, well, that's absurd, right? And it's almost kind of here Jesus kind of saying it this way, which to sort of really hammers it down a point, though. He says, what makes you think 
your body is more valuable than hers. If you're willing to cut off, to detach, dismember her personhood from her face, from her arms, her eyes, and any other parts of her body you're fantasizing about, you might as well just get rid of your own hand and eye, right? <gasps> but Jesus, I wouldn't dream of cutting off my own hand or gouging out my own eye. I mean, my right hand, no less, or my right eye. They're too important. And Jesus could respond, then why are you willing to mutilate, objectify my precious daughters? We cannot miss here that Jesus unequivocally advocates for women in this text. He empowers women by addressing the men about lustful intent of the heart in the presence of and in the full hearing of women. That is deeply honoring for the women in that crowd. The fact that Jesus was speaking his sermon outside, just as a way of practicality, the fact that he was giving the sermon outside and not in a synagogue, not in a, a holy place where only a few could enter, this pretty much women and most of the other crowd, people that made up this crowd, couldn't even have been privileged enough to hear Jesus' teaching. So, he, so Jesus locates himself on purpose in, this, in that time, in that place with those people. So to me, uh, this, is, this was even more shocking than kind of the hyperbolic language. When I started to, I said before, I was a little nervous of where the text would go. Uh, but then when I kind of got to this point in my study and reflection and prayer, I thought, wow, that's, that's a profound reality that Jesus uh, establishes. Furthermore, in this text about the cutting off of hands and eyes, um, he, Jesus, he locates the sin with the, the men doing the lusting. Um, it does not say if her dress causes you to sin or if her, uh, her face or her legs in modern times, if her midriff causes you to sin, if her bikini causes you to sin. No, it says, Jesus says to the men in the crowd, if your eye if your hand causes you to sin, gouge it out, cut it off, and throw it away. He addresses the men and communicates that all women are important enough. Temple prostitutes, regular prostitutes, household servants, threshing floor hookups, your neighbor's wife, your own wife, sisters, daughters, all women are important enough to me for men to do business with their own hearts, to start cutting off, gouging out, eradicating perspectives, excuses, habits, fantasies that do not honor women as a beautiful, whole person, embodied images of God that I spoke into existence at the beginning. Oof. This can be a tough Tough thing to hear in modern times, I am well aware, maybe at all times. Um, and I just want to say here that this is where the specificity was really profound for me. Um, there were a lot of years that I carried wounds surrounded um, by wounds that had to do with being accused, uh, blamed for being the reason for someone else's uh, choices, lustful intent, for someone else's lustful intent. There was lots of messages, explicit and implicit, that my physical appearance was the problem. My body, my f being a female in this world, was just hard for other people, so I was the problem. And I know that that is not a singular story. I know that that is a common story. 
Um, the thing is, this, this can be a really confusing message to heal from. These messages of, you know, it's, it gets confusing. Um, it, just, it's easy to go down roads of shame, of um, fear, of mistrust in general of all men, uh, competition and mistrust between other women. I mean, it just goes on and on. It, the, the, it's, it's vast and insidious. So, looking with lustful intent is not a victimless crime. It seems private and harmless, but it has insidious consequences for both parties. And so, this, we come to this question, what is God's heart for men and women? Um, what is God's heart for men and women? You know, I've, it's important to me and important to the rest of the teaching team and to be faithful to the text, to, to take a look at it, not try to manipulate it, make it into something it isn't, right? Um, but I do believe that we're in the modern time. We're here sitting in this room. This is a crowd of men and women in 2024 in South Orange County, right? We are the gathered body of Christ. And so the Lord has a word for us too. And I have been um, praying through that. That's really been uh, undergirding my, uh, as I prepare to deliver, deliver the sermon today. And I think at root, Jesus is advocating for the image of God within each human. Jesus is for women, and Jesus is for men. Yes, there's a strong case for Jesus' advocacy for women in the text. And we have to take a look at that. But hear me, this is not at the expense of advocating for men. In Jesus' imagination, there is room for everyone at the table. This is not a battle of the sexes. This is not a tearing down of each other. You know, but as we have uh, taken up the task of going through uh, verse by verse, uh, this is the set of tech. This is the set of verses we have for the day. Jesus has always wanted every part of humanity, male, female, hearts, bodies, minds, souls. He wants all of us, every part of us. And he has come to be near. He's positioned himself in our midst. He is God Emmanuel. He's come to restore and he's come to redeem this is good news. <laughs> this is the good news of the kingdom. And as followers of Jesus, we get to participate. That's the invitation. We get to participate in bringing the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. But we have to, at times, if this is within us, we have to lay down our lustful imagination. And, I, and I'll say this. Uh, without, I think, distracting from the text, women, we do have the capacity to cultivate lustful intent, right? We are. We are tempted in such ways. And so we do need to ask the Lord, Lord, what is it that you would have us surrender? So when we surrender, and this is, this is what's really cool, about Jesus. When we surrender our lustful imagination, when we when that isn't taking up the space, we find that we have the capacity to start dreaming with Jesus, to start taking on his mind, taking on his imagination because he's a creative God. He's the word of God speaking at work in our world. 
He's still on the move. And so when we lay down a lustful imagination, we find we can pick up his creative imagination. We have capacity to follow him. And through the power of the Spirit, we have the ability to say yes to the invitation from Jesus to become co-artists, co-creators in this beautiful, restored future masterpiece called the kingdom of God that he's creating. That's a beautiful vision, and I want to be a part of that. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, at times you invite us to, uh, to hear a hard word. We want nothing more uh, at this church <laughs> to be about what you're about, God. I pray for, um, yeah, I just feel, feel like I want to pray for comfort and uh, healing, for joy to be restored. For peace. God, thank you for drawing near to us. We know you are God Emmanuel. You don't say a thing and then leave, but you, you say and you stay. You invite us into living our lives alongside you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>